Hello and welcome to SAE Tomorrow Today. I am your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to have Tom Preval, Air Taxi Product Lead, Joby Aviation. On today's episode, Tom and I discuss the future of electric flight and the role that Joby will play in that future. We hope you enjoy this episode. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Good morning. We're super excited to have you here because electric aircraft is the future and what Joby's building is going to have a positive impact in the future. It's going to change the way that we commute. So I can't wait to dive into this conversation today. Tom, to kick things off, what is Joby's vision for the future of electric aerial ride sharing? Well, our main vision is to save a billion people an hour a day. Really, we want to bring uh, all electric, quiet, clean air taxis to cities around the world so, so that people can fly over the most congested parts and not, not be stuck in traffic on the ground. You're not the only one thinking that. Morgan Stanley came out with a report today from the equity um, research team, and they are predicting that the urban air mobility market could be worth more than $1 trillion, I repeat, $1 trillion by 2040. And Morgan Stanley also signed a positive light on Joby. So congratulations on that. With the company's mission to save a billion people an hour a day, How will this be accomplished? Because clearly the analysts are resonating with that message. It is a new means of of transportation, really, uh, in in cities that's enabled through electric motors, electric aircraft, essentially, that can be a lot quieter than basically helicopters today that that are being used to, to fly around cities. And so we expect to be able to provide a service to people that can take them uh, across town uh, in, a, in a multimodal trip, essentially, where they can use their, their app to book the ride. Joby is, is going to orchestrate the, the ride and potentially send you a car that picks you up at your house, uh, drives you to the next um, birdie port, think something like a heliport uh, in some sense, at which a Joby aircraft is going to wait for you. You're going to be transitioning into that, that aircraft fly to another vertiport that's close to where you want to go and then we'll pick another ride to to get you to to your destination or or maybe you walk there or take a scooter or take public transportation whatever it is that gets you there the most uh, convenient and fastest way from a passenger standpoint the passenger will be your customer what you're describing will be a completely frictionless experience Is, is that fair yeah that's that's definitely the goal that it's uh, very frictionless with very little wait time between the, the elements so, so that we can you can just continue on, on along on your journey. And it's very seamless, one app, one, one payment, easily done. One payment's the glue that's gonna hold this together. If I'm a passenger, I, I pay Joby, let's say X dollars, and I have this seamless experience. I wanna take Joby, because if you clearly stated, it'll save you time. But one of the other benefits of Joby is noise. You're going to eliminate noise because the way that the aircraft is being developed. How are you thinking about noise overall from a company standpoint? We think it's incredibly important to have an extremely low noise profile because we we do want to operate in kind of urban areas where where there's a lot of people, a lot of people live there. And uh, community acceptance is incredibly important to us. Otherwise, the, the service will, will never really take off if people are just being annoyed by the, by the loud noise there. So our aircraft is certainly the noisiest during, during takeoff and landing, but it's still a lot quieter than helicopters are today. And then very quickly, we, we take off and land vertically so, so that we can take off and land from smaller uh, areas and then like full airports, but then we transition very quickly onto the wing and, and the flight becomes extremely quiet. So you can think of it as we're flying across town that, that will probably blend into the, the urban soundscape that's already there and you will barely recognize that we're flying there. When you're developing community acceptance, I'll put it this way, you're building trust with the community, the community trust that Joby will operate a service that is not going to have an, a noise environmental impact. It'll move the residents of that community from point A to point B. And safely, as you do the community outreach and Joby um, integrates into the community, what's how will the service be offered? How will it in, in, integrate so the individual is going to, wants to go to the job or wants to go visit somebody, how will it be fully integrated into that community landscape? People will be able to just book it through through a phone app and this can be the Joby app but uh, it can also be the Uber app so so we are have a partnership with Uber and you essentially you you, you book your trip either you do it right now or you, you pick your time 
and you're, you're on your way as soon as, as uh, we can generate the trip that's, that's for you. How do you en envision the service scaling? Your, your CEO and founders made uh, public statements around possibly expanding to London, but how do you see the, the service scaling? Yeah, I mean, when we when we start, obviously, we won't start with with thousands of aircraft somewhere. I mean, we will we will start to have a, a few aircraft, probably taking off from existing infrastructure initially, mostly. So so we'll 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 start to operate communities. We'll start to be able to experience the aircraft. They they will be able to 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 hear it, to see it, and and to use it themselves and utilize it, and then. As we get this, this experience, as we also work like with, with air traffic control and other areas, where we're going to start to to scale up and and deploy additional aircraft, find additional takeoff and landing sites, and so it's it's going to scale over time as we we get this experience and also as we get the community acceptance. When you you want to save time, and I'll give you an example. I've been stuck at the San Jose airport, and then I've been rerouted to SFO airport, and I had to hail an Uber. To get, and that traffic was horrendous. That was, and I barely made my flight out of SFO to come back to the East Coast. Is that type of a route where you're going from uh, point A to point B, where there's infrastructure and there's a lot of demand and a lot of traffic? Is that an example of a route that Joby could potentially operate in the future? Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good example. I mean, that's that's a route that I'm actually taking to work almost every day. I, I live in San Jose and, and work close to the San Francisco airport, and it is very congested. For sure. So, so that is one of those those routes that would be a good candidate to to fly. So, rather than at, at times it can take you one and a half hours or two hours to get there, it would be a very short ten minute flight, 10, 15 minute flight uh, to get there. It changed the game. I, w I, I would get to the airport relaxed. I wouldn't be stressed out. Please, Mr. Uber driver, please don't make me miss my flight because of traffic. So as a, as a big part of Joby, where you'll reduce stress in the individual that has to commute for a long distance? That is uh, most certainly one part of it and, and it's the goal. So like if you have to go to the airport, you can one mode that, that we envision how this could operate is you tell us when when your flight leaves. And, and we will essentially compute when is the, the right time for, for you to have a car pick you up, uh, then accounting the, the transit time into the aircraft and, and which flight will get you there on time. I mean, maybe even with you giving us some, some preferences, some people kind of cut it a little close. They're, they're more willing <laughs> to take a little more risk. Some other folks are more comfortable uh, if they have a, a little bit of an extra buffer in there. So I think we will be able to accommodate those, those types of preferences as well. Accommodating preferences is great because there's some individuals that like to be there two. I have to be there two hours early. It's a domestic flight. I got to be there two hours early. And then you get the other individuals like me. You try and slide through and hope the TSA line is short so you can get to the flight without having to wait. Overall, you're reducing anxiety for a variety of your different customers. When your customers are in flight, what will that experience be like? It is going to be an, an incredibly great visual experience. I mean, the, the, the aircraft actually it has, has uh, large windows, uh, great, great views from all seats, since we, we only have four seats in the aircraft, um, plus a, a pilot. And so you will, you will be able to see sort of the, the world from a different angle. This is typically the altitudes at which we're flying. There's, there's maybe a few general aviation aircraft that fly at these altitudes, some, some helicopters, but typically people don't get to See, in, enjoy their their cities and, and their neighborhoods in from from that angle. So we do think it's going to be a a really incredible and nice experience. How long will the passenger, on average, be inside the Joby aircraft? Is there like a thirty to forty minute, ten to fifteen? Is there where you're kind of aiming for? I think it's going to be more on the fifteen minute, ten to fifteen minute flights, uh, relatively short flights that, that really get you over the most most congested areas. I mean, when you think about it, for example, a flight from, from Manhattan to, to Kennedy to JFK Airport is, is like a seven minute flight, but uh, it's, it's a very long drive <laughs> if you have to do that. Long drive's an understatement. You go to New York, I try and fly into LaGuardia, and the little secret LaGuardia has a, it's called the LaGuardia Marine Air Terminal. It's actually 10 minutes closer than the main terminal LaGuardia, but it's very hard to get a flight into Marine Air. And you can think about the amount of time that you'll save an individual trying to get out to Kennedy uh, for an international flight. 
you're not stressed out. You're not like, oh, please don't tell me there's going to be an accident because an accident out the way to Kennedy, you're most likely going to miss your flight. So it goes into the whole theme of this podcast is that Joby's creating a seamless experience and you're reducing stress, you're reducing anxiety. That's a game changer for everybody. Putting all that t- together, how do would you describe the Joby experience overall? Because to me, it seems like, oh, this is like I'm going into a nice Zen spa without stress. That, that, that is most certainly what, what we're aiming for. If people feel feel that way uh, and experience that way, then, then we've kind of achieved our goals, uh, I would say. So yeah, you shouldn't have to worry about it. You shouldn't have to worry about finding your way, even if you have to switch the, the modes of your transportation. So like uh, if, if you arrive at the, the Verde port, or we also call them sky ports. If you arrive at one of those sky ports, we will, we will direct you we will make sure you you know exactly where you need to go and and we will try to make this again a very seamless experience for you that that you don't have to be stressed out about it all and 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 we'll update you as you go along the trip and on on the product side of joby you have a wonderful partner in toyota what have you learned from toyota because they are the masters of manufacturing that is actually a lot that that we can learn from them that we have learned from them in in setting up our uh, manufacturing capabilities which is currently in in marina california and so toyota has been extremely helpful in kind of educating us informing us helping us uh setting setting up that manufacturing capability you mentioned earlier on the podcast that joby will operate with a pilot Mm-hmm. There's a lot of talk in oh, the electric aircraft space and the general aircraft space about going autonomous. Why did Joby make the decision to operate with a pilot? Because we want to operate soon. <laughs> we want to start commercial operations right, right after we get our our type certificate and production certificate, which we hope to get uh, in, in 2024. And we, we just think it's a much um, easier entry into operations, having a pilot. The aircraft and, and our operations are designed to fit into today's uh, air traffic environment. So, so we can, there, there don't have to be any real, any new rules or anything for us to operate. Whereas if we were to, to operate without a pilot, first of all, we would have to make sure that these operations are as safe. We would have to prove that we would have to have a, a good amount of additional technology on board the aircraft that has to be proven out and and we would also kind of have to work on potentially getting some some new rules in place that that allow us to operate without pilots in in these airspace classes in the areas that we want to operate and that just seems as a long-term goal is is good that's that's where we we want to go eventually as well but initially would be a fairly high high barrier to get across and and we we want to start we want to bring the, the advantages of the, the quiet electric aircraft into the communities as, as soon as possible and try to minimize risk and make sure that we can operate this safely. I'll say this way. It's a smart move that you decided to operate on a pilot with a pilot today. It's also a really great strategic move. And I want to stay on the, on the pilot stuff because there's something really cool. You understand air traffic control. And when we were speaking that air traffic controls, they're all done by voice today. And that was really eye opening. How would you explain to our audience how air traffic control works? Because you have this really wonderful, deep understanding from your background at NASA on that. Yeah, today, air traffic control, again, is, it's a very, very safe way. Uh, air travel is a very safe way to get across um, the world, essentially. It's, it's the safest means of transportation. It is safe be- in a way where people, air traffic controllers, actually control certain areas within the airspace. Each controller oversees a, what is called a sector, is, is a certain chunk of the airspace, and all the uh, aircraft that travel through there, they, at, at any point in time, a pilot is actually talking to a controller. The air traffic controllers are, are giving them instructions where to where to fly, which altitude to fly, and, and making sure that they're safely separated from each other. And, and as the, the aircraft like transitions through the airspace and travels from, from one oversight area, from one air traffic control sector to the next, it is getting essentially handed off to the next controller. The, the pilot is being told to contact the next controller on a different radio frequency. And so it's a, it's a very manual process and, and it requires, again, controllers, very skilled people to oversee a number of aircraft at any given time and, and make sure that they're safely separated. That is how almost all of the commercial air traffic 
works. There, there, there are other areas in the lower altitude and, and where people like general aviation or people with their, their private plane can also operate under visual flight rules and the pilots actually keep separated from each other. But as soon as you get into like the vicinity of the major airports or into to higher altitudes, you're really operating under these instrument flight rules and op being controlled by air traffic controllers essentially from takeoff through through landing. That's an example, very common route in America, the transcon route. So you have LAX to JFK, you have SFO to JFK. When that commercial pilot's there, are they bouncing from one tower to another, like the early days of cell phone roaming? Or is there one consistent <laughs> tower? Then when they get closer to Kennedy, they go to the Kennedy Tower. How does that work? No, they're, they're actually talking to a number of different facilities. It, it essentially starts at the gate. When you push back, you're going to talk to people uh, at, at your departure airport that are managing kind of the, the ground taxiing. Eventually, you're going to be handed off to the, the person on the tower that gives you your takeoff clearance. As, as soon as you're taking off, you're actually being transferred to a different facility that's it's called TRACON Terminal Radar Approach Control, which is can be a consolidated facility, for example, in, in the San Francisco area, it's, it's for all of Northern California a facility in Sacramento. As you take up, you, you're talking to different controllers there. As you transition that airspace, get into the higher altitude, you're actually going to be talking to uh, an air route traffic control center. This is yet another facility that oversees bigger parts of the airspace. And again, about every, I want to say five to 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, the pilot is being told to contact a new controller and, and talk to, to the next controller for the next chunk of the journey. So as you transition from San Francisco to New York, at the end of the day, the pilot might have talked to 20 different people along the way. That's one way to keep a pilot awake because you got to be on your toes <laughs> as you, you bounce from new air traffic controller to another. During your time at NASA, what did you learn when it comes to updating the air traffic control system? Can, can something change? Can something improve to make it better? It, it is a very safe system and it's, it's evolved over, over many years. It is very, let's say it's, it's fairly difficult to change. It's, it's pretty for the way that it operates today in, in this voice environment. It's, it's limited by basically by two things, the available concrete on the ground for traditional aircraft, just, just like the, the runways um, that are available and, and you aircraft have to be spaced to take account of, of the wakes that they produce so, so that, that you have enough distance between them as, as you land. So, so there's one big limitation is just how many runways we, we have uh, available to land the aircraft. And the other one is how many, how many aircraft uh, air traffic controller can actually uh, handle safely at the same time. Because obviously as a human, we cannot, we're, we're limited. And, and typically this number is somewhere between eight and, and 20 aircraft at any given point in time. So you couldn't in the same environment uh, just easily add a lot of additional aircraft and operate in, in this absolute same uh, set, of, set of rules. So a lot of the research that we've done was on, on trying to find ways of kind of optimizing what we have today, getting a few more aircraft on, on the ground, making sure that we don't have much excess spacing, also helping the air traffic controllers where we can, maybe with, with automation tools to just make sure that they can do their job safely as, as we kind of increase the, the number of aircraft. But also what we've learned is this is a very, it, it's a process that takes time. I mean, again, because it is an operating system that's operating very safely, you, you cannot just like flip a switch and say, oh, we're going to change this mode entirely and expect it to be just as safe. So uh, the, the research that we've done was a lot with controllers and pilots. We've, we've tried different concepts and, and would, would simulate them essentially in the labs at NASA, bring in controllers, bring in pilots, measure the effectiveness of like the, the new concepts or tools that we've developed and see how, can we can we improve the system? Can we improve the efficiency of the system in that way? When you look to in, improve the efficiency of the system, keeping in mind that it, it does move slow for safety reasons, there's new forms of aircraft coming to the market. There, there, there's consumer drones that, that are flying at, at different altitudes. Then Joby's eVTOL is, is coming online in the near future. As these new forms of aircraft begin to operate, will the air traffic control system have to be updated? Over time, 
Certainly. I think we need to find that, um, additional means. For, for drones, for example, um, what has happened is the air traffic facilities and the FAA have essentially identified certain areas in the lower altitude airspace that they feel is used very little by traditional aircraft. And so you can get, get authorization to fly your drones uh, as long as you keep them inside in those areas uh, without having to have any other control. So, so they're kind of segregated from, from the other airspace. For us, we want to start to operate in this other mode that I've described before, which is kind of mostly initially under visual flight rules, where, where the pilots take on a fair amount of, of the responsibility. And we're, we're working very closely with the FAA and with NASA to kind of find ways uh, how we can kind of evolve these operations into the, the controlled airspace, also without putting an additional burden on the existing air traffic control system. I mean, we, we definitely want to stay out of the way of, of all the, the current operations that we have that are managed fairly efficiently and, and are trying to, to integrate into the airspace in a way that is also seamless for, for air traffic control. So, so there has to be an evolution over time as we scale up. And, and again, we're working very closely uh, with the FAA, with other industry partners, with NASA to try to, to come up with ways of doing this safely. Job is clearly you're thinking through all the different aspects of how you're going to operate a service. When you're, when you're thinking through all the aspects, you're being responsible. How is that resonating with, with, with the FAA and with NASA and says, okay, Joby's taking the right steps? We have a lot of good collaborations uh, with both the FAA and, and with NASA. And we have multiple Space Act agreements, for example, with, with NASA on, on doing this kind of air traffic research and trying to find ways. I think it's, it's at least we hope we are a trustworthy and trusted partner here that, that is going to the start operating very responsibly. And, and we've been working a lot with, with NASA, for example. NASA has been measuring our noise profile of the aircraft to objectively validate essentially what, what we say about, about the noise. How does NASA measure that? It basically came, came out to our test site where we were doing many, many hours of test flights and, and put, put out test equipment, microphones, and we would overfly them in certain profiles so, so that they could measure the, the sound levels and noise signatures at, at different altitudes and, and distances from from the aircraft wow and is, is this going back to your relationships from nasa that you were able to bring those relationships to joby partially i, I certainly i still have a lot of friends at, at nasa and, and uh, still continue to like to work work with them but uh it's also just in general a good relationship that existed before i actually joined joby between joby and, and nasa so there's multiple pathways we we have a overall a very good relationship between nasa and joby well, I'll sum it up this way. You further cemented it. And the work that you did with NASA, Mark Moore was there and just did incredible re research during that time at NASA. And I'd I love to know, in your opinion, what does the future of air traffic control look like? In the long run, we will have to have, have basically different types of operations, some of them like directly integrated in, in the same airspace. I, I don't think there's going to be a very major change to the way that the, the current commercial air traffic is going to operate. I, I do think technology is going to play a, a bigger, bigger role over time. But, but by and large, I think it is actually relatively efficient for those parts. So um, for these new entrants like us, where we're going to have to develop some some new ways and that might mean as we integrate it initially we may may need to after a while after we saturate kind of what we can do today uh, we may have to carve out for specific routes that are very high demand we, we may have these as, as like specific uam uh, uam meaning urban air mobility routes from from a to b in which you can fly maybe with uh, less controller in action if you uh, have some technical data connectivity. So I, I, I do think like information exchange, digital information exchange between the operators uh, and, and the, the FAA is going to play a big role, making sure that everybody has a common picture of, of the traffic, that, that everybody understands like the air traffic controllers know exactly where the Joby aircraft are going and they, they have like their designated routes, their designated procedures uh, that they follow. Uh, 
are, are very predictable so that Again, we can we can operate at a higher scale, but but fairly seamlessly inside the airspace without interrupting the the rest of the traffic that's going on. So Joby's clearly thought through air air traffic control. How about on the infrastructure standpoint? What needs to happen to ensure that Joby can launch and scale a service? We can initially launch from. There's a lot of existing infrastructure, like uh, heliports and and at airports that exist today. There certainly needs to be some electrification. We need to have the capability to charge the aircraft at these locations. There, there may need to be uh, some, some other adjustment or, or changes for, for the electric aircraft. The, the FAA has actually come out and drafted a standard for, for verde ports and, and what, what are some of the expectations around this. So, so there may have to be some, some modifications. But again, we, we do expect that we can launch out of existing infrastructure quite a bit. So we should be able to do this this early on and then of course over time as we scale up and we want to we, we also want to get to the places where where people want to go right these can be areas that are really within the cities that are um, currently don't have any existing infrastructure so so we we uh, also want to develop some some new infrastructure over time at, to get people really close to to the places that they want to go to when you develop that new infrastructure, is the electrification, the charging aspects, the, the microgrid, is that, is that going to be one of the key components to ensure that there's enough electricity to charge your aircraft there? It is one of the components I, I don't uh, that, that we have to work with, but I don't think we are that overly concerned about this because, I mean, with the electric cars and uh, charging stations everywhere, this is uh, not, not something that's entirely new today so i think this is something that that we certainly have to work with um the utilities and other areas but i, I don't think that's the, the toughest problem to do no oh, and putting this conversation into context what is the future of electric flight i think there's a great future for electric flight i mean it, it is limited obviously by by the batteries by by the range so uh we'll start with shorter flights our aircraft can fly up to 150 miles. That's sort of, so as we said before, that the shorter flights, the, the 10, 15 minute, minute flights up are certainly the, the beginning and they will play a big role also because you can, you can avoid huge congestion in, in those areas. So I think there's, there's like a, I, I envision a great future where we have a lot of quiet aircraft moving people very seamlessly around, around cities and, and see some of those visions that maybe many many years ago you've seen in <laughs> comic books or visionary movies or things like that uh but but i i really think it's it's gonna be great it will be great and i love to meet george jetson so please <laughs> uh, build a jovi ev tall so i can meet uh, george jetson and his son ilroy it'll be uh it'll be wonderful there and, and tom as we look to wrap up this really insightful conversation what would you like the listeners to take away with them today there's a lot of great things to come. We're, we're really looking forward to, to getting this, this service in place, letting people experience the, the Joby aircraft uh, and moving people, moving people around. This is, this is all doable. It's, it's a, a nice challenge. It's a great challenge to have, but we are very confident we can, we can get it done. We can get started and, and people should just look forward to getting a whole new way of transporting and flying around cities that they've never experienced before. As Tom said earlier in this podcast, there is a great future for electric flight. I 100% fully agree with Tom because today is tomorrow, tomorrow is today, and the future is Joby Aviation. Tom, thank you so much for coming on SAE Tomorrow Today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to SAE Tomorrow Today. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next. Did you know rail is already one of the cleanest modes of transportation and it's about to get even cleaner? Join us next week as we hear from Michael Cleveland, Director of Advanced Energy at Progress Rail, a Caterpillar company, as he discusses the transition away from diesel fuel that promises to make the trains cleaner, quieter, and more reliable. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. 
SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.